So we've taken a look at backgrounds. Now it's time to take a look at sprites. If we load up Mario 2 into Emulicious, you can see quite clearly then uh, your active sprites here in this window. And you've got these three banks where we load in the tile sets. If we take a look at the Pandox, you can see the VRAM has three blocks, as they call it. I often say banks, but they call them blocks in the documents. And you've got 0, 1, and 2. This refers to 0, 1, and 2. Now, the first one, as you can see with Mario in, is always for objects, which are sprites. So you can see they are always referred to in the first one and the second one. So sprites can effectively appear in the first window and the second window. So the first bank and the second bank. And background and window objects can either appear in the exact same place. So in these first two banks or blocks. And effectively, both sprites and backgrounds and windows all share the first two, with the third one being unused. Obviously, like here, can't use. Or more commonly, and what I believe the dev kit does automatically, is set it into this mode, which is done by setting the LCDC bit 4 to 0. And that shifts the backgrounds then, meaning the first half of the backgrounds is in the bank number 2. And the second half rolls over, in a sense, into the middle one. So the way that I like to think of it is it pretty much always defaults into this mode. And if so, sprites are always in the top, backgrounds and windows are always in the bottom, and the overflow for both ends up in the middle. So we'll play with that later. But now let's take a look at loading, say, this Rusty Pug sprite into our game and moving him around. So I've got the sprite here. All we have to do is do File, Scripts, GB Export, and export the tile set. And then for later, I've also made just a unique block of 256 different blocks and an inverted one. So these can act as like a background. These can act as a foreground. They'll come into play when we want to test and confirm our theory on how the tiles are loaded. So in the code, all I've done is imported those three sets of tiles, the same as the last videos. We have the rusty tiles, we have the inverted unique tiles, and just the unique tiles. In the build tasks, I've also included all three of those. And then we have a blank project, which if we run, does nothing at the moment. But we do turn on background and sprites. So what we want to do now is load in the rusty sprite. And the sprite is actually 32 by 32, so it's 4 by 4 tiles long. So let's just start with a single tile first and load that in. We've done this before with a set background, where you've done set background data with set BKG data. And in this case, the only difference is we're going to use set sprite data. This will pull in the tiles, but load it into bank zero instead of bank two. So we'll start at zero. The number of tiles is defined in the rusty tiles header. So we can use this value for the number of tiles. And the data is obviously the rusty tile set. If we run this now, we should be able to see that loaded bank zero of the tile sets. And you can see them all here. So they're now loaded in, which is what we want. And that's what that does. And next is to actually set the sprite tile, which is this window here. So this is the sprite sets that are now in memory, they're in VRAM. But in order to use them on screen, we have to load them into here, into this actual sprite tile. So these are the position 0, 1. You can see it goes up to 39 on here. So this is the limit of how many tiles can be on the screen at once. So now if we do set sprite tile, and it'll say the number, which is the number out of that 0 to 39 that we just saw. So what part of the on-screen sprite position do you want to use? We'll use 0. And the tile will be uh, in the rusty tile map. And we want the first position. And that's because in our exported map here, it will do the first position here, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So we have all the tile map here. And if we are going to load 16 tiles, then we need to load 0 through to 15 tiles. And the map will say position 0 is 1, position 2 is 2, 3, 4, 5, like this. And you'll notice position 16 is actually tile 5. So let's just change that to 1 instead of 0, because the first one was actually mostly a blank tile, as you saw at the top left. So let's just temporarily load in the next one, which should be the ear. Again, we'll run that to visually see. And you can see now the ear is loaded into position 0. 
So this is now ready to display on screen and it's got a red line through because it's not physically on screen at the moment. And finally to bring it into screen, so let's just load these first. Fill, uh, tile set bank zero with character sprites. Set sprite zero to character. And then this will become zero through 15 to character when we do it. And now we want to move character to screen. And you got this with a move sprite. And there's an interesting thing with move sprite, where if we take a look at the GBDK docs, you can see that the position here specifies the horizontal position minus eight and the Y position minus 16. Doesn't really give a reason why for on that, but let's follow the docs. So in order to be at the top left, we'd have to be eight and 16. Otherwise zero and zero, the sprite would be off the screen on the X by eight and up off the screen by 16. So we want to move the sprite zero, which is this sprite here. So the sprite ID, and we want to move him eight and 16. And that should now move it onto screen. And there you go, you can see it's now on screen and it's at the very corner of the screen and the red lines disappeared. So let's get into moving the character around. I know we haven't loaded the full character yet, but let's just get him moving around. We've got the basic game loop already. Let's make a few variables now. So eight bit integers and we'll call it move X. Set it to zero. And move Y, set it to zero. We now want to check the buttons as well. So we'll do the buttons first. And we'll call it buttons. And that's with the function called joypad that reads the buttons. And now it's a simple case of if the buttons and the joycon say left is pressed, then you want the move X to be minus one. I'll save the buttons and J right. Then we want the move X to be one. And the reason we wouldn't use a switch here is because we want multiple instances to be possible at the same time. So a switch will only ever result in one being valid. We might want both left and right to be valid. We might want up and down to be valid. In this case, we want things like up and left, down and right, down and left, all the cross-sectional D-pads to be possible. So for that, we make sure we just do an if and else for left and right, so both can't be pressed at once. You could also change it to being, if both were pressed, stand still. It depends how you want the mechanics, but for now, this will be simply left overrides right. And then we don't do an else if for the up and down, we simply just do an if again. So now the up and down are independent of the left and right. And for that, we'll just do a move Y up and down. And then the last thing to do there is simply scroll the sprite. So this will move it from its current position by the amount we say. So in this case, move X, move Y. And that means every game loop, so every frame, it resets to zero. And then if a button's held, it sets it to one or minus one in the right direction. And then we move our character. So if we run that now, we should be able to move around the screen with no limits. So there you can see I can now smoothly move the character around the screen using my keyboard and mouse. However, you notice our character is actually 16 tiles, not one. So let's just do this the brute force way for now without any helper methods. And this is usually called a meta sprite because it's made up of multiple sprites. And it's as simple as for now, instead of doing loops or anything, let's just hand code all this so you see exactly what's going on and understand it. And then we can always move this into helper methods and functions that make this much cleaner and easier to use. But for now, all we're doing is setting the tile sprite to the position of each one. And then we want to move them all onto screen so we have all 16 tiles there, and next is to shunty them across. So the first row of four goes left to right. So we need this to add up in eights. So this will be eight, 16, 24, 32. The next row drops down one. So the 16 gets an eight added. 
which becomes 24. So in which case, all four of them become 24. And these follow the same pattern again, 8, 16, 24, 32. 8, 16, 24, 32. 8, 16, 24, 32. And then just continue to add eights down here. So 32, 32, 32, 32. And finally, the last row at the bottom, 40, 40, 40, 40. So obviously all this will be much easier in a for loop and in a helper class. But again, let's just dump it in one at a time to make sure we know what's going on. And now we should hopefully see the full rusty loaded. And you can see we've obviously done something wrong here because we have the wrong tiles loaded. You can hover over here as well and see which tiles are loaded. So that one we forgot to reset to zero, which means they're all out of order by one. So that's possibly the only issue. And then did we make the same mistake there? No, we didn't. So that should just be the only mistake. We just set the first one to one for that example to show the year, and I never changed it back. There we go. So you can now see the rusty on screen. However, if we move, you can see we're only moving the top left sprite now. So the tiny part of the year is now moving. So the final step is to move the entire sprite or scroll the entire sprite in this case by the same amount. And you guessed it, we're just gonna literally copy and paste for now. And now with any luck, we should have a moving pug on the screen. And there we go. We now have a meta sprite that we can move smoothly around the screen completely. And we can do all sorts with this now. We can clean up all this code, which we will. Uh, we'll also make things to store all the player information so it makes much more sense. But let's just go backwards a moment so we fully understand now when we start mixing sprites and backgrounds together, what's going to happen. So I explained that this one would always be filled, this bank two, with backgrounds and windows, and this one will always be sprites, and the middle one's mixed. But let's just confirm that by actually setting. So if we just hide the rusty sprite for now, and we just set the sprite data to be filled with the unique tiles. And let's just take a look at what's happening there. And you can see there now the entire first bank and second bank is filled with unique tiles. You can see now the Rusty has turned into those tiles. So we know that now all the sprites are there. Let's copy this, paste, and set the background data now. So this will be fully filling everything. We'll do this with inverted tiles, just so you can tell the background from the foreground. And you can see what's happened there is the background has overridden the sprites on the second section. So if we were to now change this rusty sprite to use something from the higher order, like say tile 167. So if we were to say change this third tile to use tile 167 instead of what it should, this will be the middle bank, now bank one. You can see now the rusty sprite has successfully used a background tile. So you can kind of see the behavior that this set sprite data and background data is nothing special. And the tile sets and the tile data effectively in these memory banks is not specific to as such the background, the window and the sprite. At least the middle one isn't. The middle one, whatever's in there, could be accessed by sprites or backgrounds independently. So if we just simply flip the order around of what we did there and say we loaded the background full of data and then the sprites after, and you can see now the sprites override the background's upper half. So what if we now load all the background data but then in the sprite size, we just go to say 200. So we don't fully override. We should find that the sprite data only partially overrides the background, which is also true. So you can see, however you load the data in, you can just control these sections. And the only difference between set background data and set sprite data is the starting point of zero to 128, whether it starts to load here or starts to load here. You can then access both sprites as we saw in the actual output here. So if I just remove the, or comment out the unique sprite data, might as well leave in the background and load in Rusty. And then you're gonna have a Rusty 
movable object. If we also correct that back to what it should be. And we'll have, you'll also notice if you're wondering what that background data is, that's where the Nintendo logo was when the BIOS loaded in essence. So this is where Nintendo used to be, and you can see we can walk all over it. So I think that's it for this one. You want to make sure you understand sprites and backgrounds and these three banks of tile sets very clearly and play around with this until you're happy you understand it fully. And then next, we might as well get Rusty running on top of this Nintendo logo. That's it for this one, guys, and I'll catch you in the next.